everybody joining and screens popping up and faces that I recognize. Hello. And you can hear me um, as we are getting everybody out of the waiting room and into the presentation. Hopefully you can hear me. We'll do a thumbs up if you can hear me. Uh, but uh, for this presentation, we have everyone, uh, their microphone is muted. However, as we have opportunities for discussion, and if you have questions that you'd like to ask or comments, um, we will engage you and you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. We'll make sure that you get a voice too, because just like all of our events, this is interactive. We're learning from each other. Uh, so we will definitely have that opportunity. We'll, we'll wait a couple more minutes as everybody is joining. Y'all, I love it. Um, I don't know what view you have on your screen, but I like seeing everybody's faces and I'm seeing so many pop up. This is awesome. Yes, Catherine, thank you. Feel free to use the chat box. Um, as always, on all of our Zoom uh, formatted events, you can type a question or a comment in the chat box and we'll see that. Don't forget that even though your microphone is muted, you can still use that reaction button down there. So if you want to um, clap, if you want to do a thumbs up, if you want to share the red heart, um, you know what? There's a laughing emoji here, and I know that there may be some chances that we want to laugh too. We, we laughed with Tyler Wood last week, uh, for those that joined us, when he said, I don't like feet and I don't like touching feet. We all probably could relate to that. Um, so feel free to use that um, and to celebrate. And I think the celebration emoji is something that we should definitely be using today because we're celebrating this month especially National Family Caregivers Month. You'll see the background behind me. Uh, ALS Texas every day, every month, uh, every year celebrates our phenomenal family caregivers throughout the state. Um, we work to support every member of the family and we know that the commitment of a caregiver is unlike any other. And we also know that um, in our state, we have just under a thousand registered ALS patients, y'all. That's registered. Those are the ones that we've connected with. There's many out there um, that we haven't. So if we have just under a thousand patients, we know that we've got probably at least a thousand, if not more, when you count young caregivers too, um, caregivers in our state. So we celebrate y'all. Um, if we have patients joining us today too, and the screen continues to fill up, I love it. We uh, celebrate you every day as well. Having these conversations about caregiving can be difficult. It's difficult for both those living with ALS and for um, their loved ones who are caring for them to sometimes have these conversations, you know? We all have a different experience in the ALS journey. And we're trying to juggle our own emotions, um, our feelings that we'll talk about today, the frustration, the guilt, the anger, all of those things. And yet we know that at any moment, the person living with ALS would trade and, and want to do all of those things that family caregivers are doing. Uh, and that's what Tyler Wood remind us, reminded us of last week is show compassion, give hugs, and know that if they could do the things that they, they need you to help with, they would. Um, I know it just immediately came to mind uh, one of our, um, our uh, families that I saw at clinic, and she is living, our patient is living with ALS. She said, you know, in asking someone to help her go to the, the bathroom, and she said, I know they get frustrated with that, but come on, do you think I would honestly ask for help to go to the bathroom if I didn't need it? You know, it's no fun for me either. So I think we're going to hear about all those things today. So with that being said, welcome. I think uh, we may still have some people joining us, but I love seeing all the faces on the screen. I am Tanya Hitchman with ALS Texas. I think I've met most of you, and if I haven't, 
I look forward to getting to know you more. But we are going today uh, to be visiting with Diana Root. And um, I have had the pleasure of getting to know her uh, even more over the last year and to uh, be honored. I am honored to walk alongside them in their journey with ALS. And our team is honored to any way that we're able to provide support, we want to do that. So this week we're gonna be hearing from Diana and the female caregiver perspective. And uh, the female caregiver is oftentimes wife. Uh, we know that there's daughters, there's nieces, there's uh, moms who are caregivers, but oftentimes, and what we see so often is the female caregivers are wives, they're partners and, and caregiver. And how do you balance all of that? And so we're gonna talk about that today. Again, everyone, your microphones are muted. Um, as we have just a discussion with Diana, and it'll be just open discussion. We'll kind of, I'll kind of be asking her some questions and we'll hear her insight and her personal experience and uh, journey. And if you've got questions, feel free to write those or type those in the chat box. And if you would like to ask a question, uh, just raise your hand. And um, if your video is off, we totally understand that all of our groups and events are a safe place for you to hopefully show your video. We want to see your faces. We want to engage. If you're not comfortable with that, we certainly respect that. Sometimes families want to join these events and just want to absorb it and not speak and not necessarily be seen. And we certainly want you to set your boundaries. For today's workshop, if you would like to ask a question or you have a comment or you want to show some support for Diana, we'll ask that you do turn your video on so that we can see you raise your hand and we can uh, go in and unmute your microphone, okay? So please feel free to continue setting your boundaries and know that we want you to engage, all right? So with that, we will get started. I know it's a little bit after uh, the hour. We want to respect everybody's time. Diana, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I was really surprised that you asked, but thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with people and just share what's going on with our household, with my husband, and also um, to learn from everybody else that's in the group. That's one thing that has been so amazing and so really um, <laughs> life-saving to Dutch and I is to have your support, Tanya and Steve and Catherine and Amy, who used to meet with our groups before COVID ha um, hit us all. And if we didn't have you guys to, to help us, to throw us a lifesaver, uh, we would really be drowning. So we're just so thankful for all of everything that you guys offer us. And even if we we're not talking to you on a daily basis or even a weekly basis, knowing that you guys really do have our back and that you're there if and when we need you, um, it's meant the world to us. So thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you for that, Diana. I, I know I can speak for our entire team. Again, it's our honor. Uh, we are honored to walk alongside you and Dutch and all of our families. Um, Everything that we see and hear from you daily adds fuel to our energy and passion. So uh, we are grateful to have that opportunity to do all that we can as a, a chapter. Uh, and our entire team feels that way. And again, um, I'm so glad. I don't know why you were surprised that I asked you to join us. But that, that shouldn't have been a surprise. But that does speak to your personality. And I love that. Oh. <laughs> Well, I love to talk and I'll share, so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit, if you don't mind, about more about you and Dutch and um, your journey and current experience and where you are in the journey with ALS. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Dutch and I have known each other since we were 12. We met in junior high school. We did not start dating until our last year of college. We were just kind of in that group when you're buddies with everybody. And then, gee, as college starts ending, maybe you start looking a little differently at some people. So that's kind of what happened in our case. Um, 
so we've been married almost, well, next year will be 40 years. So we've been together for a long time. Um, the, and see, there's where you can use that celebration emoji up there. Oh, yeah. Um, so we've been, yeah, we've been together for a long time. Um, we have two boys. Uh, one is 29, one is 34. Our youngest is autistic. He lives at home with us. He was diagnosed when he was four. So we started joining support groups 25 years ago to help us with the journey with our son. So when I started being suspicious that Dutch had some kind of neuromuscular disease, I started plugging into the ALS.org um, or ALS Association pretty early, probably six to nine months before he started seeing a neurologist because I was suspicious. Um, I am a registered nurse and the last five or eight years of my career, I've been working home health and hospice. I have taken care of patients with neuromuscular disease. And one of my very, very favorite patients of all times had ALS. And so I took care of her for eight months and I watched those last really um, challenging eight months of her life. And that was 10 years ago. So it's been, um, ALS has been on my radar, but for a very different reason. And so now to be walking in a different pair of shoes on the path, um, this is, again, I'm really grateful for all of you. You all teach me things that I haven't seen in my, in my career. Um, because everybody's journey is different. Just like we've had with our autistic son, you see one person with autism, you've seen one person with autism. You see one person with ALS, you've seen one person with ALS. There's a lot of um, overlap and a lot of similar traits. And of course, there's gotta be reasons that you even get the diagnosis. There's There are common signs and symptoms for this, but how it, how it unfolds in each person and how it unfolds in your family and your household, that's all very unique. Mm -hmm. That's so true, especially in our ALS community. We know that every day can be a new normal, but that new normal is different for every family, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are common threads, but it's so different. And Diana, I, you know, um, speaking of common threads, you mentioned, you know, nurse and, and working with families and even in your own life, um, you know, and in being involved in connection and support groups for years, 25 years, mm -hmm. your personality is that of a nurturer, you know, um, and that comes through in all that you do. And so many times as nurturers, and I know probably um, a, a great many of us on the call today, I mean, just let's, well, let's back up. Just because you're a caregiver doesn't mean that you were naturally given the gift to, to be a nurturer, right? Sometimes you're in that position and you're like, this is not my comfort zone. I mean, this right. is, um, this is not where, where I shine, but you learn. But for many it is kind of a gift of caring for others. And with that, we so often forget to focus on ourselves right? and to take that time. How do you do that? Um, for a few years, well, probably maybe close to eight years or so, um, I used to look forward to going to a Pilates class. There was two things that I would try to do. Dutch and I used to walk. We would get up at five o'clock in the morning and take a dog and we would go for a walk around the neighborhood and we'd walk about an hour every day before going to work. So that was one thing that was kind of like, not only was it the physical um, exercise, but just either, you know, clearing your mind, maybe you're praying in your head, maybe you're talking about what happened yesterday, last week, what's going to happen today, making plans with the kids, that kind of thing. So walking was a really big deal for us. Um, and then um, I hurt my back and I found that for to relieve back pain, 
going to Pilates was a really good thing. And um, I would go twice a week and make a point to do that because that was like my self-care thing. Is like, okay, that's my therapy. That's what I would have to do. So those were the things that I really tried to continue doing, but walking the neighborhood became more difficult for Dutch. Then it was, I'm going on a walk by myself. And that was kind of strange to not have him with me. Um, but you know, it's a new normal, like you were saying, it's a new normal. Okay. That's what we do. Then COVID happened. My Pilates classes went away. So, so then it turned into, I get to zoom with a group once a week for an hour. And I look forward to that one hour a week. And, um, you know, I kind of use that to sustain me, I guess. Yeah. How do you, and I think that's so important in whatever way that you can do that. You've got to have that self-care. Um, you know, um, I, it, it was at clinic too, and I, I was talking to uh, a wife and caregiver and sharing that we had opportunities like this for her to connect and to focus on her self-care. And she said, I don't have time for that. I just don't have time. I've got two boys that are in school and, and so much going on and lost her job with COVID, so many things. And I told her, you can't afford not to. Right, right. You've well, got to carve out that time. It's like that airplane analogy that everybody tells you. You've got to put your, your mask on first because yeah. if you lose your oxygen, you can't help anybody else. And I would do that when I was um, making home visits with patients and, and, and their families. And I would look to the caregiver as well. It's like, you need a break, whether we need to organize some formal respite for you or, or whatever it might be. If you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. Mm -hmm. so, yep. That's so true. And being a wife, your mom, wife, caregiver, nurse, you wear many different hats. And how do you set some balance with those? And, and let me ask, do you and Dutch have like a signal or a sign where you can communicate, I, I need a break from the, from the caregiver perspective um, and also to signal, um, hello, I'm, I'm your wife. Mm -hmm. um, um, how, how do y'all juggle that? I think we're constantly working on that. Um, I think it's easier for me to fall into the, the caregiver role because it just seems like that's kind of, um, I don't want to say necessarily intuitive, but a, a position that I've been put in, whether it's through my work or it's been through my extended family, um, it just seems almost like a default role. And then I think for those of us that are moms, um, it's a big default role. And so anytime you see anybody that looks like they might be in need or you anticipate a need or you, you know, you're kind of predicting a need, you're just, you just, you know, you're kind of like putty. You just fill in the gaps and you don't think about it. Um, so I think, you know, for us, it's a balancing act because there are times when it's like, no, you know, I need a break. I need to just whether it's I need to go take a walk or, you know, let me take care of your immediate needs right now, whether it's like, can I get you something to eat? Can I get you something to drink? Are you comfortable? Are you okay right now? Because I've got to sit down and pay these bills. I've got to sit down and return these phone calls. Dutch is having more difficulty with speech. So I'm having to be available to do more, um, to kind of take over more of the household role, the household duties, where it used to be split pretty evenly. And, you know, he would deal with our finances and pay the bills. And although I knew what was going on, he would do that because I would do that for some other extended family members in our, in our house or in our, well, in our family. And um, then it became... Uh oh, now I'm taking on another role. So I think that it's a constant balancing act. And it's um, 
Some days it feels like whichever forest fire is burning the brightest, that's the one that gets the water. That's the one that gets the attention. Um, it's nice when everything is under the radar and kind of smoldering, <laughs> but then there are the <laughs> days when we get the big flare up. Yeah. What, what would be, um, looking on today's call, we've got, you know, more than 30 people that have joined today, which makes our hearts so happy for our ALS community and family. This is what it's about, is connecting and supporting each other. We learn more from each other, all of us, you know, uh, it takes a village and it's collective wisdom. What would you share for uh, our two the brand new caregivers that may be joining today that they they are dealing with a recent diagnosis they're just in the beginning of the journey of the ALS experience what what would what would you say to them when dutch was initially diagnosed and it's now been over a year just over a year last october october of 2019 is when he got the official diagnosis and I think part of it, because we were so used to being in support groups for our son, we started telling everybody right away. Um, Dutch's symptoms were obvious enough that people could see something's a little bit different, but it was still subtle enough that you know people at work didn't know yet. And he wanted to have the um, ability to tell his coworkers, his boss, his friends himself. And so I think the sooner you can, if your employment <laughs> allows for it, I think the sooner you can be candid and direct with it because the flood of people that wanted to help and the offers of, you know, first there was, can't believe this, that whole disbelief kind of thing. But then came the offers of how can we help? We want to help. What can we do? Um, and that's really important because you've got to feel like you're being supported because this just pulls, this pulls the rug out from underneath you. The ground opens underneath you. And I think you just, you need to get support and you can't get support unless you ask for it. Um, start telling your friends, start telling your family, um, look to the ALS Association. There are so many programs and people that you can network with and you don't know how fast or how slow this journey is going to be. Um, Dutch and I have always tried to prepare because of our son and knowing that we would need to, um, you know, think about him after Dutch and I were gone. And so we've tried really hard to prepare that way. We didn't, <laughs> ALS wasn't on our radar. We didn't think it was going to happen like this, but I think it's kind of um, helped to shape our, our mindset that, okay, we've got to make plans. We've got to make plans and um, put things in order so that, you know, things move slow, great. Hopefully we'll kind of hit a plateau and that would be lovely. But if things don't, or if things accelerate, you know, we still want to feel that we're in a good place. We're going to land on our feet. Mm -hmm. So I think mean, start telling people, start yeah. sharing, start telling people. Yeah. I often share, um, it's hard for many of us, and I, I can speak for myself too, to accept help or, you know, to say it's easier for me and for many of y'all to say, I, I can do this. I'm going to go until I have no more gas in the tank, until I'm, I'm wiped out. And that's really the, the not a healthy approach to say, I'm going to go until I have nothing left to give. And so starting out early and accepting that help and not uh, stealing someone's blessing. I right. share that story often. People want to help. That's and right. it's not about us all the time. It's about what they want to do. It, it really is. It's grace. It's being able to show grace. It's about being able to receive grace. Um, in July, I think it was either in June or July, and this is just a little example, 
our bedroom is, you know, everybody probably in their house has either that hot spot or that cold spot. Well, our bedroom tends to be the hot spot and the cold spot, and it's always opposite the season. So in the summer, our bedroom heats up to an oven, even though the rest of the rooms in the house feel okay, it, it's, it's, we're baking in there. So I said, I think instead of running the whole house at 65 degrees, which is going to be impossible, we need to get just a unit for the bedroom. He couldn't do it. I started doing a little bit of my, you know, consumer report, trying to do research online for a little um, single room unit. And I thought, you know what? Friends have been wanting to do stuff. We've got COVID. People don't want to come in the house. I don't want to let people in the house. But I thought, okay, this is something a friend of mine can do. Would you mind doing the research for me? And I mean, she got right on it. And she's doing all this. And she's sending me all this information. And we'll look at this unit and look at this unit. And we've, there we've got five of these over at Home Depot. We can go pick it up. We can come in and install it in your house. And it was... And Dutch felt so bad. He just, I don't want people doing this. I don't want people. I said, people want to know how to help. This is how people can help. They want to do this. And, and then he just kind of backed off. And then after that, once the unit was working, every day when he'd walk in that nice cold room, he would just thank our friends for bringing that unit over. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that story. That's so powerful. Let's let's take a break um, and see if anybody has a, a raised hand, give you an opportunity if you want to chat with Diana as well and ask any questions or share any comments or feedback. I'm looking and I'll rely on some of our other team members to see if I see any raised hands. I see Carol Booth raised her hand. Carol, we will unmute you. Hi, Carol. Okay. Hi. Um, very nice hearing what you have to say. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Managing your expectations is huge. Um, accepting help, I like the way you said, show and receive grace. That's been one of our biggest, one of my biggest issues. Um, I uh, did, there were two things. Oh, you mentioned Pilates. I usually do that on a Saturday, but I've been doing yoga probably the last 20 or so years of my life, maybe once a week or so. Mm -hmm. uh, with COVID, and I, I loved my teacher and she's at Dallas Yoga Center. Well, dallasyogacenter.com is now doing the yoga online on Zoom. And I highly recommend to any of you who have any kind of interest, look into their program. They have a whole bunch of stuff. I joined for, a, it's a monthly fee, but you can do it for one class and try it out. Um, my teacher is Caroline Beasley. She teaches 12 to 1. Um, and I, like I said, I used to go once a week. Now I really try to do it four or even five times a week. It's, wow. it's that easy to get into it. She does different parts of the body, so it's never the same thing over and over. And um, I just, I would highly recommend that. I agree with you. You have I, to I was, have something I agree like that. with you, Carol. I, I only do it once a week now, but it's, we're Zooming and um, Kathy at the Pilates studio and Alan is where I, now I Zoom, but it's, mm -hmm. it is, it, it, it really puts some more gas back in my tank for sure. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad Absolutely. that that works for you too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that, Carol. Sharing resources and places to go is all part of this as well. Um, thank you for that. Paula, I see, I see your hand raised. How are you doing, lady? We'll get you unmuted. Just a second, Paula. We still have you on mute.
Hang tight with us. We're getting there. Hold that thought. Don't let the thought go away. Well, I'm not sure why we're not able. There we go. Yay. I think I had to work on my end too. <laughs> okay. Um, a suggestion on, there are a lot of uh, yoga videos. Um, I, I usually do with my iPad or even on the TV that are free. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, I, sometimes I think, oh my gosh, I, I, I need some yoga. I need something. Yeah. And I don't have to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. and it's a at on the moment, you know, uh, and it's free. So um, I'm sure, you know, if you've got a space that you're already doing that and space in that uh, a group that you're doing with, that's one thing. But I like the uh, capability of just jumping in when I think I need it. And also, um, I, I think faith plays a big part. Huge. <laughs> and one of the things that I have, and, and I'm not, I'm not casting nets, uh, but catholictv.org is excellent um, because there again, there's times when I just needed something, especially during Lent and with COVID and actually my husband died in February. And uh, so I was really by myself, but by going to catholictv.org, when I felt the need you can just go in and say a rosary or just watch a, a video or something like that. Um, and, and I just think that uh, not only do we um, need to, uh, as you said, fill our tanks with um, material food, uh, we need to fill it with spiritual as well. That's right. So that being said, I will be quiet because it's your show. <laughs> Amen, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> so for no, the moment. It, <laughs> that is awesome. And Carol, can you, we had somebody uh, ask in the chat box for the name of the yoga uh, uh, location that you mentioned. Will you type that in the chat box, please, Carol? Go double check. I'm pretty sure it's DallasYogaCenter.com, but I'll double check. I do have another question and you can hear me, I, I guess. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. um, Another thing that I had started to do, my husband actually had ALS for about 13 years. We have actually only been married five, um, and I knew he had it. it. It's a very slow progression, but <clears throat> I started about oh, eight months ago thinking, okay, the time out, I'm going to take a day at the, a spa or just get a massage, go get something to eat and go to a hotel and um, spend the night. We needed to find some overnight people. Um, then COVID hit. I also, though, one time there was no hotel room <clears throat> and I called a friend who has a nice little place above her garage and I said, can I just sneak back there and go to sleep? I don't want to talk. I don't want to, don't want to be a guest. I'll bring my own sheets. And she's said, sure, come on over. We ended up drinking a bottle of wine first. But that said, um, does anyone have any resources for, for, you know, just an overnight caregiver or just somebody who might come in some Saturdays or some Sundays? Um, we do have a wonderful person who comes in Monday through Friday from nine to one. And um, I can't stress how important that is to get somebody really good and don't settle for anybody who's not. Um, but I, I am trying to find, just locate some other, just as things progress, a little more help. So if anybody has any um, suggestions, uh, I would love to hear them. In the meantime, I'll double check the yoga, uh, the yoga center. Thank you, Carol. And y'all feel free if you've got suggestions and recommendations. Thank you, Emily, um, for commenting. Uh, but yeah, chat box is a great way to uh, write recommendations if you've got experience with caregivers. And we can also keep the chat. So if people are putting phone numbers and locations in there, then we'll be able to send that back out as a recap from this too, so that everybody can have those resources. So that's a great place to do that. And I'm also looking for more 
raised hands if anybody wants to ask a question or uh, say hello to Diana. I see Pat Garrison raising her hand. I, I feel like this is I spy. I'm looking on my screen and I'm like, I spy Pat Garrison. All right, Pat, we will unmute you and you need to probably check your settings to unmute yourself as well, okay? Hello. 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 Just in keeping with the exercising and doing something for ourselves, something I do, used to do a lot, uh, it's this uh, DVD. Um, it's a 20 minute, it's walking at home and she's been around a long time. And also YouTube has lots of video and it's really just walking in place, doing um, every, any, there's a 20 minute for beginners and it has really helped me. I haven't done it now in a while, but sometimes I can sneak in a 20 minute real quick and it's in the house, you know. So just thought I'd throw that out there too. And she's also, it's, uh, she's been around, it's Leslie's the song or the soon. But any, I just wanted to throw that out. That's a real quick, it just makes your body move. Mm -hmm. so, in case anybody hadn't seen you before. And also she has a big following on YouTube also. That was it. I just wanted to throw that out there. I Thank think, you, Pat. I think the self-care thing is so important. Um, I think everybody's right that's either doing yoga or doing walking or if you can carve out 20 minutes for yourself you just have to do it because everybody in the household suffers if you don't um dutch just got a power chair about two weeks ago and so now there i think there was somebody maybe when we were on our ALS support group on Thursday night, somebody was talking about, they go and they do a walk and roll, which I thought was a really cute little phrase to do. And I thought that was wonderful because that's what we are doing. And it's, it's a piece of kind of like our normal pre ALS life that we can do. And although he's not walking. And in fact, yesterday he was saying, I like being able to do this because I can control it in my chair instead of me pushing him in his wheelchair around the neighborhood. So it's like, he's got a sense of independence and control. And he was like, I like it when the breeze is on me and more, you know, so it's just, it's really nice that that's a part of, all, it's an adaptation of what we were doing that was part of our normal routine. We still get to do it. We just kind of have to change the way we do it now. But so we do, and uh, we we enjoy the time to walk and roll and, and break in his his uh, new power chair. So it's that's good. I love that rock and roll. We're going to have to do something with that uh, for ALS Texas. You know me. I'm always thinking of these names, and I'm like, what can we do with rock and roll with? wheelchairs and activities. So I, I have to ponder was, that. Carol, one. did you bring that up maybe last week? And it was, yeah, you guys would call it walk and roll. And I thought that's good. That's really good. So I like that. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? I love these questions and everybody just connecting with each other. I'm, I'm scrolling through my screen for other raised hands um, or comments. One don't thing. be bashful. Something I would like to know from the caregivers that are have been doing this a lot longer than I have, one thing that I do find that's pretty overwhelming is the paperwork. The paperwork in managing, my husband was working full time before um, and had intended to continue working for a few more years. Um, before his ALS diagnosis. And now with his ALS, and um, he was at a point in his career that he could retire, but it just seems like, like trying to manage all of the, the medical aspects and the decision-making that goes along with the, with the medical condition, then trying to manage uh, and navigating pensions and social security and Medicare and trying to get all of that in place, it seems like it's kind of come on as a, a, almost like an avalanche because it's all pouring on at about the same time. And I find that to be pretty overwhelming. There's some days when I just look at piles of papers and we've been 
good about keeping, you know, file cabinets and, and folders and trying to be really organized throughout all of our married life. But all of a sudden, it just seems like an avalanche. And I'm just wondering if other people have experienced that or if you've found ways to unbury yourself. <laughs> I see some heads shaking. I'm looking for raised hands here. Beth, Beth has her hand raised. Just a second, Beth. We will unmute you and make sure you have unmuted yourself as well on your screen. There you go. My husband works um, and uh, well, everybody's working from home now, so it's no big deal. Right? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. yes. Okay. He he works, and the thing is, is that his employee told him things like he used to work with a media uh, a media um, pad instead of typing because he couldn't do. He just were out typing that computer. So he used to use a media, a media pad. And then, and then the boss said, do dragon voice. So you can talk to your computer. He said, told me, I don't need that because I can use my media. And I said, use a dragon because one day you're gonna have to use both. So now he uses the dragon he doesn't use the media anymore, the media pad, but now he has eye gaze. But and he has his uh, adapted for the job computer. It's just uh, because the eye gaze, you know, it can be a big old computer that you're looking at, okay? But he can't work. The, the, his job does not permit a different computer to be used, safety, safety stuff. So he has a strip that he uses for eye gaze that's put at the bottom of the computer. And he uses his eyes to, to type things. And he has, a, he's Brazilian, so he has an accent. And sometimes the dragon doesn't like it. So he uh, has, to, has to type it in. And, and, you know, he keeps on doing things to keep on working. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he gets upset. And all I say, I'm going to move away. You're going to have to deal with this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I can't do anything. You're going to have to yell at yourself if you're going to do that. And, and Beth, you're right. Sometimes you want, you're like, you know, I want to get away and, you know, escape from just the whole situation um, from what we didn't expect uh, or where we expected to be in life and from what Diana said from the paperwork with having to deal with everything else. It's very expensive. Yeah, it is. Did, did anybody have, and Beth, thank you for that. Anybody have any thoughts on the, the mounting paperwork that's still sitting there while you're dealing with the day-to-day -day activities? I, I know I saw some heads that were shaking. No, I definitely saw that. I'm looking for some raised hands and um, comments if anybody has any. And maybe it's a universal problem that nobody has an answer for. And that's one of the things we need to keep on our radars. Maybe some support with that too. Lakeisha looks like she's... Okay, let me scroll. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, Lakeisha. Hi, Lakeisha. Hi. Um, I don't know about the mountain paperwork. It's just something you just can't get around. But what I would suggest, if if you don't already, you definitely need to get um, HIPAA waivers, advanced directives, yeah. power attorneys yeah. in place. Because if it comes to a point where his speech is delayed and, you yeah. know, or you need to call on his behalf, yeah. you definitely those things already lined up. Yeah, um, we've got, we have all that in place and you're absolutely right. And thankfully we did, but it, but then it kind of, then you're back piloting the plane again. And, you know, I'm, I'm used to having a co-pilot 
Well, some of this, it, it, I'm finding I have to fly solo more. So it, it's, it does help. And you're absolutely right, Lakeisha. You've got to have all of that paperwork in place so that you can do more paperwork. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that, Lakeisha. All right, any, let me scroll back and forth here. Anybody have any, um, any other questions for Diana? Or Diana, do you, have, uh, do you have other questions for the group too? I'm, I, one group that I um, particularly think about a lot with the caregivers are the caregivers that have young children at home. We're not in that position. We're at the point where we do have an adult son that lives with us, but Dutch and I are both in our mid sixties now. So we're not, we're not in that position that we're trying to raise children. And I marvel at the parents that are dealing with a spouse that has ALS and trying to raise their children as well. Um, that's, that's a real balancing act. And, and I know the stress that um, other members of our family feel, like our kids, of course, watching their dad go through this. And my in-laws, Dutch's parents are both still alive. They're 86 and 90. They still live in their own home independently. And it's hard for them to, to um, watch all of this happening as well. And so I, I, I'm curious how everybody else handles that. Yeah, and I know with today's group, we probably have several um, moms and caregivers on here too, moms that have youth and children at home. And I, I'd love to hear from them if they're comfortable, but I also wanna take this opportunity to share that while COVID made 2020 a year like just about any, unlike any other. Um, I saw a, a meme the other day and I'm sure y'all have seen it too. And it said the new standard for, you know, how was your day? And the response is, uh, it was 2020. Um, and that, that pretty much explains how this, this year was. But the good that has come from that is that things like today, we have 35 people coming together throughout the state that are sharing, 35 people that may not have been able to come to an in-person group mm -hmm. um, because as a caregiver too, carving out time to drive somewhere to visit and get back home means you have to get someone to help care for your loved ones. So it's helped us to focus on that. In that whole process too, we have really launched a lot of programming and education for young adults, youth and children. We have an amazing, um, Youth Leadership Council, I keep saying we need to have a more fun name for that, but the bottom line is they are amazing young people who were involved in the ALS experience and or are now, and they are passionate about helping other young people. This is college age all the way to five, and we have workshops, we have support, and we're going to have online support groups for those age groups starting in January. Uh, because Diana, to your point, it's a lot to juggle and having that community that gets it mm -hmm. is really, really important. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Anybody on today's call want to talk about that? Emily. Yay. Hi, Emily. I see Emily's hand raised Hi. and you're Hi. Hi, Emily. I don't know that I have any great answers, but um, I can at least empathize with those <clears throat> excuse me, who do still have kids at home. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing this six years. My kids are now 13 and 17, but we've been doing it at what I would call pretty pivotal <laughs> years of their childhood. And I honestly thought um, as they became teenagers, it would get easier, but um, it really hasn't. And I think that's because our needs have changed. Their needs have changed. Teenagers need you in a way very different than preschoolers or elementary age kids need you. Um, and so it's a real struggle. Um, Tanya's doing great things by getting these kiddos involved in 
having opportunities for support groups. I think um, my kids don't know any other kids that are going through this and they've done it for six years now and have certainly um, been adaptive and they're amazingly resilient. But had they had um, people that other kids that they could have partnered with and talked to, I think would have been great. I don't think they like talking to me about it because I think they think it's going to burden me more. Um, And also, I don't know what it's like to be a, you know, 13 year old and have a dad who has, um, you know, late stage ALS. I can't relate to that. I can relate to it as their mom or as a wife, but I don't know what it's like as a kid. And so I think it is just fantastic that we are going to be starting this up for the kids to have Um, their own support groups. I really think that's been an unmet need. It's something for sure I think my kiddos could have benefited from, and I'm really grateful that they'll have that opportunity going forward. Hopefully, um, since they've been at it maybe longer than some other people, they can at least uh, empathize and and perhaps even share some words of wisdom with those um, other kids going through it. But it's hard. I mean, I don't think it matters what age you are. It is hard, but certainly trying to be both a mom and a caregiver is definitely um is is doubly stressful yeah and I don't know that I'm doing a great job at doing either one um I feel a lot of times like I've been unsuccessful and I feel defeated a lot and that's just raw honesty you know I'm I am committed to doing the best I can um for everybody but it's it's hard I think what you're saying, Emily, I, I relate to a lot mm-hmm. of that. And like I said, I don't have young kids at home, but some days, you know, where you're feeling like really defeated and you're doing the best you can in the moment. And that's all you can do, because if you think mm-hmm. too much, I think too far in advance or too much about it, it's overwhelming and it's almost paralyzing and you can't do anything in the moment. So you've almost got to stop and make yourself break it down. What do I need to do in the next five minutes? What do I need to do in the next 10 minutes? Because if you think too much about what do I have to do in the next week or the next month, it gets pretty overwhelming. I totally agree. That was one thing I felt like I adopted pretty early on is what has to happen today and maybe what I need to plan for tomorrow. And then we'll figure the rest out. Yeah, because so much of it has changed from what it was like a year ago. And, and, and in your case, I know you've been doing this a lot longer than I have, than we have, but, you know, go back seven years, go back eight years, your life was so much different. Mm -hmm. So what was important to me, you know, keeping the house nice and neat and tidy, uh, not so important to me now. Mm -hmm. I want to keep it clean, but it's like, okay, it's over in that box, (laughs) you know, and before I'd open every box and make sure everything was put away and some things like, well, you know, that's all right. It's not the priority right now. It's not the priority today. So let's work on today. I love that. It's okay to say not today. And I want to, I want to go ahead and and share too, because y'all will see uh, Connor. Uh, So Emily's 17 year old is one of our amazing youth leaders that has stepped up. And so when we think, you know, and this is just, parenting regardless of what we have going on in our life but I think all of us can relate every day you're like okay tomorrow I'm gonna do better I'm gonna have more patience I'm gonna have more time I'm gonna have more wisdom I'm gonna have my stuff together it goes down the list and I know I've seen in Connor Emily um that you do have your stuff together and you're doing a good job because where he's at and how he wants to connect with others, um, it's powerful. And th- this youth, it's a group of four or five leaders that have great ideas. But when they first came together, much like this, they were on a, we did a Zoom call. And I, y'all know me, for those that know me well enough already, or and you will, I was blinking really fast to hold back tears because that group of college-aged uh, young adults and teenagers, they were singing happy birthday to each other. There were some birthdays we were celebrating and they just immediately connected because like Emily said, they, they didn't know others that understood the journey. Just like y'all here, you're hearing very similar stories and you're like, okay, I'm not in this alone. There's a group of people that get it and that I could reach out to if I needed to outside of this call. 
And that's exactly what they did. And so I was blinking fast because I was like, I can't cry with these kids. I've got, I've got to, um, but um, Connor gets it and they're going to be doing great things um, because of their experiences. Emily, you're doing great. You really are. If you're, and if your kids are willing to be engaged like this and reach out to other kids, you're doing it right. Hi. Uh, look. Yes. Um, hi, uh, Emily. I'm Esme Lozano. I'm from La Feria, Texas. I'm at this literally the southernmost tip of Texas, uh, 10 minutes from the border. And uh, what I can tell you about my experience in caring for my father um, uh, is that I engaged my little girl. I didn't have a choice um, because she was seen. She wasn't understanding. I know your kids are older, but I, I engaged her early on. She knew how to section. She knew what I needed to get when I was changing him. She knew how to blend his food. She knew how to feed him, um, you know, and uh, she became a source of comfort for my father as well. And um, it, it was teaching her about life from a loving, caring perspective. Uh, it was teaching her empathy. It was teaching her um, about how to multitask. It was teaching her a lot. And she would tell me, mom, why don't you go take a nap? I mean, she's only 10, you know, at the time. And, um, and it, those 15 minutes, 20 minutes of a nap helped me because it was difficult to find respite help because none of the caregivers, as I mentioned in my comments, uh, were trained. We had, at one point, several that came in and, and interviewed and one showed up and then didn't show up anymore. So there was that, right? Um, so um, it's really easy to beat yourself up. Uh, and I say that to everybody that's here. Uh, it's really easy to feel that you're not doing enough. Um, but I, I challenge you to be patient and loving with yourselves. It, it was difficult for me to do, especially as a Mexican American woman. And I see a, a, a couple of my paisanos here. Um, it was even more difficult because I could not find, even when I did get a caregiver who spoke Spanish, uh, believe it or not, near here. It's a very difficult, it's, it's a very different ball game when you have a language barrier. And um, it's, it's not easy. The forms that you were talking about, Diana, <laughs> try trying to figure that out and explain it to your dad who wants to be in on what it is that you're signing on his behalf. Right. And, um, and so I learned a lot really fast. And um, I also was very hard on myself. And to this day, sometimes I, I still have my moments where I go back and I say, you know, I could have done this better for Miranda. I could have done this better for my dad. You know, why was I so grouchy this morning when I went to help? And why was I so grouchy with her and snippy with her? You know, and, um, you know, your, your mom and your kids love you. Your dad, your grandpa, your grandma, your aunt, uncle. And um, just know it's okay. Know you're doing a good job. And whenever you're feeling doubt, have your kids hug you. Just tell them you need a hug and tell them to hug you. And you'll understand how much they love you and how great of a job you're doing. Thank you. Esmeralda, thank you for that. I love hearing from y'all. And again, it's about lifting every, each other up, you know, everybody um, locking arms. When we say that, it's so easy when you hear organizations and teams say, you know, we're in this together and locking arms. With ALS, there's no way that any family can do it alone and you truly do have to lock arms. It's, it's impossible. And I love that caregiving from young caregivers, that perspective came up today because as we continue in our um, series, next week we're gonna actually hear from another one of the young caregivers, uh, Gabriel Paveda, and he's going to share his perspective. Uh, he's now a sophomore at UT Austin but he's going to share the perspective of being a young caregiver, kind of what we've talked about today too. So um, our hope has been to bring the different perspectives because it is different. Uh, the journey and the feelings involved are different for everybody. Mm -hmm. I know that we are getting close to our, our time for today and we always want to be mindful of your uh, schedule. And Esmeralda, I love that. 
you mentioned some key things too that we have on our radar as far as hands-on training for young caregivers because we know caregivers as young as five years old are helping with the things that you mentioned, suction. And so if we know they're doing that, we want them to, to be trained and to know how to do it and to, to have that uh, confidence as well. But we will hear from uh, Gabriel next week and his perspective today because I am notorious for getting all caught up in the touchy-feely wonderfulness of these groups. I forget to share um, some of the other stuff we have going on. And that's everybody who joined today is going to be entered to win prize drawings. We have got prize drawings all month. Last week, we gave away an engraved cutting board uh, for the, the uh, male caregiver series. Today's, we, today, we have two prizes. Today, we have a wind down uh, package, um, and that's a bottle of, uh, yeah, <laughs> Carol's like, I don't care what it's a bottle of, but it's two bottles to help you wind down. Yes, Emily's like, see, I told you y'all would use those, those emojis. Um, so we will draw a name. Um, after this, I will, I will uh, draw a random name for the wind down, and we have a gift card to Dry Bar for a blowout. So you can carve out time to go get pretty and come home. And, you know, whether you're, for me, I know when I go get my hair done, I usually come home and end up cooking dinner and doing dishes. And, you know, I'm like, I got my hair done for this. Uh, but try to, to carve out something where you can uh, take a selfie, take a selfie and say, you know, look at, look at my new do. But those are the two prize drawings that we have for today. So we will notify the winners um, this afternoon. And before we end for today, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat box or any other hands that are raised. Carol, you've got a, a Carol and Charlie. Let's hear from Charlie and then we'll go to Carol, okay? Charlie Olson. And uh, Charlie, make sure, there you go, you're unmuted. This isn't really about caregiving, but I wanted to, uh, to all of our veterans, tell them happy, uh, happy Veterans Day. Yes, and thank you. my son had made some little desk that uh, he, he lasered them. And they say, uh, Department of Defense, uh, wait, United States of America, uh, Department of Defense. Then on the back, it says, thank you for your service. And I have different sizes. And if anyone would be interested, if you'll let Tanya know and she can get me a list and I'll mail them to you. It was just something he did last year. And then, you know, then I haven't been out and about to give them out. So just as a token of thank you for all of our veterans. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, that is just amazing and so generous. And I love the uh, creativity in that too. So yeah, if you're interested, let me know and I'll make sure I connect with Charlie. All right, Carol, you said you had one more comment before we close. Just a real quick question. How is everybody feeling about going out when you talked about the hair, bl the blowout. How are you all feeling about going out, being the caregiver? If something happens to you, it's definitely going to be affecting our, mm -hmm. our partners. Um, anybody have any, is it just buckle down and sit tight? It's going to be a bumpy ride. Uh, what I do, my, my hairdresser I've gotten to for maybe 30 years, has her shop in her home. And so she only lets one of us in at a time and she cleans in between. On um, doing my hair, I don't worry about that. Uh, I had gotten comfortable going like to Costco because you have to wear a mask. But um, there's so many cases, new cases every day here in Lubbock that I've started asking my son to do all my pickup again. You know, he did for a long time. But I'm, a, I'm afraid that I could get, catch it and bring it home to Ken. And that's the last thing, you know, any of us need to do. So that's my take. 
I agree with you. I, I feel like that as well. You know, it, it's if you get sick and you're supposed to be the caregiver, we're in double trouble. <laughs> That's true. Very true. I don't see any other hands that are raised. Um, Diana, thank you. Um, thanks for being, uh, well, first of all, thank you for taking time out of your schedule. We sat here for this hour and talked about how hard it is to carve out time for yourself. And I want to, I want to celebrate every one of you that took time out today because it was so important to connect with each other and to share resources and, and just, again, lock arms. And Diana, thank you for taking time out um, and just talking to everyone. And do you have anything else that you want to say before we end uh, today's presentation? Well, again, I kind of started and I come back to thank you, Tanya and Steve and Catherine. And thank you very much for being there for us because I don't know if you know how much having your support and just knowing that you're there for us really helps and just being part of this community because nothing is like walking in the same shoes as the person that's going through a real dramatic experience. So um, it's just helpful to know that we're not in this boat by ourselves. So thank you very, very much. Absolutely. It, it, dramatic and traumatic, right? It's a yeah. traumatic experience. Yeah. I'm going to write my, uh, my phone number in here for those that may not have it. And, um, and I'll do my email too. All right. So y'all should have that. Again, we, we'll send this in the recap. Um, so you can have the information that was, you know, if there were resources shared um, in the chat box, names of the yoga studio or caregiving information, we'll share that. So you'll have that as well. But um, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I don't see any other hands raised or comments, but I do want to say thank you for taking time out. You know how to reach us. Please reach out to any of our team members anytime, and we are here for you. And thank you again, Diana. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take right, care. Bye. Stay Enjoy safe. the rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.